That would be cool. It's a lot of money when you start getting all that. Are we ready to go? Are we live? Yeah. Yes? Yeah. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of From the Stump. Today, um, I'm going to be making some cuts. I tell guys this all the time, and I thought, you know what? There was this old, super dry, gray, hard to cement ash blog sitting on one of our demo machines out front here. So I thought, what a perfect opportunity to grab a couple of different blade pitches and let's run it through this stuff and see what kind of patterns or what difference it makes in our cut. Um, I'm hoping it shows you something. Uh, I figure it will, it should. Um, at least that's just a guess. So we're kind of doing a little bit of an experiment here. So we'll find out. Ash has been a challenge uh, for me through the years. And I think probably for many of you or of us that are running sawmills, you just never know what you're going to get into. If it's a sprung piece or is it the bottom part of the tree or the middle part of the tree? Um, this one here in particular has got a, a Y on the end of it that we ended up cutting out of it. So there's a fair bit of stress down towards the one end of this log um, that we're probably going to see in the cut, or I suspect we're going to see in the cut. So without further ado, I'll start this up and we'll make a cut and let's see what happens. All right, so we made it through the cut and give you some feedback because I know you can only see so much on the camera, but that was a pretty tough push. Um, definitely some different feedback at point, uh, versus when I was up here. When I started getting into this uh, tension section, you could definitely feel some vibration in the head like it was really digging in. Uh, and I had to definitely give it a little bit more pressure to maintain a proper feed.
Okay, so sorry everybody, we had a uh, little technical glitch there. Nobody could see anything or hear anything, so they cut the feed. So hopefully this is better, we switch it up. We'll find out if it's not, our producer Josh will cut the feed again and then uh, we'll figure out what we're gonna do and we'll come back. So if you stayed with us, thank you very much. I'm gonna go back to hopefully where we left off. I'm not too sure exactly where we left off. So I made a cut uh, with this. What we're using, we got an old piece of ash here, super hard, it's been around for, I don't know, I bet this guy's probably been down three years at least. And it's been sitting out here half cut in the sun, just cooking. So it's hard like a piece of cement. Um, the blade I just used to make the pass on the cut that we're gonna look at here right now is a seven, eight, seven degree, okay? When I was making this cut, if you weren't able to see uh, when I was doing that, because we had those issues, this first part of the cut wasn't bad and it was pretty steady pressure, not much was changing, but you can still see the blade was chattering and I don't know, hopefully we can pick that up, but you see all these little lines in here? You can see that the blade was chattering like this when it was cutting. So that's an indication of a couple of things. So one, right away you might think, okay, I can blame the blade. Maybe it's the wrong blade for what we're trying to cut which is what we're gonna try and discover today. Um, this is also a very possible that the feed rate was wrong, that maybe I should have been leaning into it a little harder and I should have been cutting a little faster. So there's a couple of things that could come into that. My personal thoughts on this are that the seven eight is just a little bit too aggressive for this log, uh, being that it's so hard and that when I switch this out to the three quarter, it's probably gonna get better. Now you didn't see, um, and maybe we can still show you. Braid, can you come over? I'm gonna flip this back over so it's the way it was when we cut it. Put it back on the top here. It's getting even it out there like it should be, right? Yeah, you can still see, which is perfect. Slide it down my way. Okay, good. So you see, okay, it's good. So you see down the end here, when I was cutting, it was pretty consistent right up until I got into where this limb was on this. So this is the second cut, I would guess, or maybe a third cut, but there's some big limbs on this log. And once I reached here, there was a definite change in my cut. Okay, the pressure increased. I had to lean into it a little harder so that I could keep the same feed rate. Uh, it was still cutting, no problem. And then definitely could feel the load on the motor when I got down into here, where you can see this other big limb. And that makes sense, because you see how this is sprung. And that's the tension that's in this log, okay? So we'll get that back off of there. I'm gonna switch blades here. Talk you through what I'm doing. So I'm just taking this operator's side cover off. Braid, can you take that other side off, that other side of that cover for me? Back in the tension off the blade. Brand new blade, everybody, too, as well, okay? So this blade that I'm using, it's never made any other cuts other than what we've done with it here today. Okay. I'll get this out of the way. Put a coil in him just to make him a little safer. Okay, so now we'll grab our other test blade here. This is a three quarter, meaning we've only got three quarters of an inch from tip to tip on the tooth. But not only is it different in the pitch, you can give me a hand there, Braid, make this a little quicker. You don't have to go fast, just take your time and put it where it's gotta be. It's gotta go in the guide there, right? Eh? Okay. Never want to race when you're doing this. This has to be right. So, Okay, don't put that on yet. So got that three-quarter pitch blade on here. So I was saying there's not just a difference in the pitch. So that other blade we were using is a 7 8 7 degree. This is a three-quarter 10 degree. So not only have we changed the spacing on the teeth, but we changed the angle on the tooth. So that's going to have some impact as well. I'm curious. 
same as everybody to see what that might be now I cut I got this pretty tight guys like normally I'll set up around six but I know this is wicked hard so I'm running about six and a half turns so I'm running full pressure on this blade that's all happy no noise guides are set through my little metal checklist get them these latches done up okay that's happy so i think we're good we'll get set up here to make another pass i'm cutting these at eight quarter as well guys so here's the other bit of information i'm going to use this uh, ash that we're cutting here today for the tabletop for our from the stump table so that's going to kind of be our meeting place where we get to sit and hang out and talk to you guys and and converse so We'll keep up on that project and take some images so when we're all done, we can see it start to finish. Eyeball everything so that I'm not going to run into any rusts or dogs. Looks good. Certainly good. I'm not going to adjust the guide and I'm going to do that deliberately, everyone, because I don't want to influence how the blade's going to act, okay? So this is exactly the same setup that we had. All we did was change the blade, okay? So we'll get that board out of the way. I'm not too interested in that board right now. Um, look at the cut that uh, is on the back side of it there. I'll brush this off and try and get a look here and see. Oh, quite a difference. And this is what I was hoping. So this is this is good. This is good. Okay. So, and I don't know. Daniel, if you can get it, you see these lines here? Maybe from my side, if you look at it that way is better. If you can see these lines, everybody, you can feel them with your bare hands. If you can see these lines in here, they're harmonic, okay? So this is exactly what I was suspecting. So this is something, and this is why I recommend having a couple of blade pitches in the shed, because as much as you think you know what might be the best uh, blade for what you're cutting sometimes it's not i would have i would have thought that the three quarter would have done a better job in this but it doesn't. Um, clearly the seven eight seven makes a nicer cut and you can see it there's still a little bit of chattering here but there's far more here okay so this is an old hard dirty piece of ash um, there's lots of stuff out there that follows this same sort of pattern that when it's drying, it gets, it gets harder and harder and harder. And it already had tension to start with. So, uh, just kind of something to keep in mind that even though you might cut in pine and spruce and you know that seven, eight, seven is the right blade, maybe keep a three quarter in the shed because once in a while, if it's super, super hard, one might work better than the other. It might surprise you. So. Hopefully that gives you some feedback on blades. We're going to take a short break. I'm going to switch over to the table and uh, I'm going to go to some questions that we didn't get a chance to answer last week. Okay, we'll be right back.
I'm Kelly. Our wood cookie minute. First thing I want to talk about today is fire safety. I know most of us don't think about fires with the sawmill, but it's a thing. I know at the end of the day, you're all done, you're tired, you're looking back over the sawdust and, and you think nothing of it, but that's where it's gonna get you. At the end of the day, you're gone home, you might not be near your mill, and that sawdust will catch on fire. And it will create huge problems, not just for your mill, but any structures around it. We know from experience that this can happen, so please take the time, rake that sawdust out, make sure you're good, clean it up, so you know everything's okay for tomorrow. Fire safety was tip number one. Tip number two is a personal thing that I have done before, so I just want to share with you what I've come up with to kind of help me as I'm rolling the logs up. So I know that the mill is going to stop where the mill's going to stop at the end of the bed. But setting the log, knowing where that blade's going to finish, that sometimes is an oversight. So I just take a marker every day. I just take a marker. I find the end of the line. I find where that blade's going to finish. Pretty much at that bump. And I mark it. Then that way when I know I put the log up, I'm ready to cut all the way through. My name's Kelly, and thanks for watching. Okay, everybody, thanks for hanging in with us there. So if you have any questions, please, again, go ahead, put them in the comments, uh, send them to me. I'm more than happy to look at them. I'm thankful for them. So if you like what you're seeing, give me a thumbs up. Love to always know where you're watching from. So if you don't have a question, just shoot something in there. I just think that that's really great, uh, knowing where everybody is around the country that might be interested in what we're talking about. So a couple of questions that came in last week that we didn't get a chance to answer live. Um, Jack from North Carolina uh, asked me, he said, I want to know uh, what do you run the water tank and how do you know how much is enough? Both really good questions and you know, those are questions that come up all the time, uh, especially with new mill owners. And I think even existing owners, uh, you know, we're always looking for something newer, better, maybe than what we're doing, right? Um, myself, I use a, a mix of pine salt and a dish soap. I don't really care what dish soap it is. I just try and find something that's dark. So if it's that super dark green or that really dark dawn blue, I like. Um, and the reason for that is, is it makes it visible in the tank for me so that I can keep an eye on how much water's in there because if it doesn't have any color you can't tell um, so that's why I use that dish soap the pine saw I use um, because I get into cutting uh, a lot of different uh, pine species and they're usually pretty sticky and the pine saw really really helps uh, wash that pitch off the blade so it's not so much that the, it's there for lubricity. I guess it probably helps a little bit in terms of making it more slippery in the cut, but it's more along the lines of keeping that blade cool and keeping the pitch and the buildup off of the blade while you're cutting. And that little bit of detergent in the water helps that. So Jack, good question. Thanks for uh, writing me and letting me know that uh, you had that. Another one here, and this one's from way up north, which is kind of cool. Uh, so Frank, um, uh, in Alaska uh, wants to know what is the best blade for spruce and how long should I expect a blade to last? Um, so this varies big time guys. So, you know, when you're talking to guys and they give you a guideline on how long a blade's gonna last, it's, it's, it's really depends on who's doing what. So the numbers I'm gonna share with you, this is really in general, and this is more what I experience so I can share that with you because I know that that's, that's, a, that's a fact. So when I put a new blade on, um, I cut a lot of hemlock. Uh, so let's say I'm cutting hemlock uh, all day, uh, 8 to 10 foot lengths, um, somewhere between 14 and 
22 inches in diameter. I can run I can run with a new blade until about two o'clock in the afternoon. I know somewhere around one or two o'clock that blade's going to get tired. It's just kind of my rhythm and how many logs I've moved. Uh, in terms of logs, that's probably, I don't know, it might be seven logs in, eight logs in. It would depend, something like that. Um, so rough timeline would be an hour to maybe an hour and a half in the cut. Okay, that's actually cutting the wood. So the blade will have been on the mill for five or six hours, but it hasn't been cutting the whole time. Half the time the mill's just sitting there doing nothing, just idling, burning gas, right? So timeline on a on a blade, Frank, I wouldn't expect more than an hour and a half, two hours tops. Uh, it's going to start giving you bad results. You'll start seeing, uh, I call it blowout or fraying on the ejection side of the cut. As soon as that blade loses that really good, uh, tip on the tooth, you'll start seeing this out of the edge of your boards, and that's a sure indicator that, okay, this one's getting tired. I'm going to have to start watching if I'm going to be getting waves or dips and stuff like that. So uh, keep an eye out for that. In terms of pitch with spruce, um, actually exactly what we were just using, uh, that 7.8, 7 degree is, I just think the the, the cat's a meow for that. Um, we were typically using you know, a few years back, it was all 7 8 10 degree. And the 7 8 7 degree was developed for winter cutting because um, it did such a good job in frozen logs. And frozen logs are another deal altogether. Maybe we'll do an episode on that uh, one day. That'd be a good topic. Um, but the transition uh, between the 10 and the 7, uh, what happens is when you stand that tooth up, it does a better job of ripping and doing the transition between the cross cut and the rip okay because the tooth is more vertical when the grain changes direction it has a, a it's better at controlling the cut between the two okay when they meet up there at the limbs and knots and stuff like that um we had another question come in but uh i didn't see it do you have a visible there dan a question here oh okay so pete's asking a question what is the best blade for hickory <laughs> That's good. You know what I wish, uh, Pete, I wish I had a blade uh, or I wish I had a piece of hickory here we could do it with. So hickory, real. I haven't had the chance to cut a whole bunch of it. Uh, I've done a few shows out Texas way and I've gotten uh, some that I've been able to cut. And hickory is a really hard stuff. It's a lot like this ash, I think. Um, I don't know if there's any one true blade that I can tell you that's right for that log. If I was going to cut it, uh, I would start with a 787 and I would switch it out to a three quarter. And I would, and just like I just showed at the start of this video, I'd make two passes initially on whatever I wanted to cut, and then I'd make a decision on which one gave you the best results. If I had to guess, I would think the three quarter would do a better job. But again, jury's, jury's kind of out on that. Um, Another question here, does, and this is uh, Pete and Patty from Arkansas. Oh, hey, Pete and Patty. I remember you guys. What is the best blade for hickory? We did that. What are your thoughts on blade sharpening versus buying new blades? Another good question. Um, so here's my thoughts on sharpeners and new blades, okay? I think every sawmill owner should have a blade sharpener. All right. Do I think you should use it every day? No, I don't. I think that you should buy new blades and run new blades. And I know everybody probably thinks, oh, that's because they want to sell new blades. It's not. It's because most of the fellas that I deal with only have a limited amount of time to run the machines. OK, so when you do get the opportunity to use your sawmill and you got a plan and you got this giant sweet log that you want to cut and you want these results from it, um, the last thing you want is a blade that you tried to sharpen and then you put it on the mill and you're cutting this big log and you, you know, you waited two weeks to have this Saturday that you could do it and the blade goes crazy on you and you get crappy results because it didn't get sharpened right or it's set wrong or something's going on like that. Okay. So new blades just save all of that for you. So you can go into that project 
you can count on it, you know it's set properly, you know it's properly sharp, and then you can spend your day and at the end of your day get some really good results. Now I'm not saying that you can't learn how to run a sharpener and get really good results because you can, but it's how much time do you have, okay? So, you know, lots of guys say, oh, I'm retired, I got lots of time. Well, any of the guys I know that are retired are busier now that they're retired than they were when they were working. So that's also uh, a difficulty. Um, so there's some thoughts on that. The reason I say I think every sawmill owner should have a sharpener in their, in their, you know, in their shed or in their shop is because you just don't know what's going to happen on any particular log. And most guys don't have 20 or 30 blades sitting around. They usually got five or six. And if your buddy comes over on the weekend and he says, oh, I got this big log. Can you help me cut it? And you go say, sure. Okay, let's, let's go do it. Let's, let's have at it. If it's come out of his front lawn, odds are you're going to run into a whole bunch of debris and you're going to wreck four or five blades in a hurry. If it happens to be Saturday of a long weekend, now you're shut down for the whole weekend unless you got a sharpener. So if you got a sharpener, you could always fix up the old blades. You can still keep going. So it's kind of a redundancy. It's just something that, uh, that'll that help you uh, maintain and keep doing what you want to do. It's a backup plan uh, to me. So uh, that's just my thoughts on it. I'm not saying everybody has to follow those rules, but that's kind of what I share with people when I get asked that question. So thanks, guys. Really good question. Um, Frank, I didn't finish my answer to you on that spruce way up there in the north. 787, hands down, I think is the right blade for that because the knots on the spruce versus the clear part of the lumber are so hard that when you make that transition, the blades just want to surf around them. Um, and the more stood up the tooth is, like I was saying, the better off you are about making those transitions, okay? Uh, another question here. What is the main impact of pitch and angle on performance when cutting different log hardnesses? Also, I might, uh, and, and this is from Heath. Heath, thanks a lot. So I think I probably touched on that already. So, but I'll kind of go back to the basics of it. Um, pitch in particular, okay? So when you spread that tooth apart, depending on the type of wood that you're cutting, you always get a different uh, type of chip from it, right? So cedar's different than oak, uh, then it's different from pine. And if you put a blade pitch into something that the spacing is too tight together and the chip is too large and it's sticky, what happens is that gullet of that tooth isn't just a U that they just randomly picked the shape up from. It's there because it's meant to take what you've cut and fire it out of the gullet and get it out of the way. When you nose it into something that doesn't match the pitch, what happens is it can't get it out of the cut quick enough. It all piles up and sandwiches in the cut, and then the blade has no choice other than to start going crazy. It doesn't know where to cut because it can't get rid of what it's cutting. So that's something that, you, that you're kind of going to play with as you go through. And there's some guidelines like we share you know, where 787 is, you know, is, is better in the softwoods and that type of thing. But I just, you know, I go back to this is all recommendations and you never know because what I just cut, I would have thought the three quarter would have done a better job than the 787. And I was wrong. The 787 did a better job. So not always do the guidelines apply, but they're good rules to, to go from. Uh, so I recommend having both. Um, and then you'll you'll get to know which ones work best for you. So, another question we have. Uh, actually, this is my last question. Uh, this is from Jerry in New Brunswick, uh, in Canada. For all you guys down in the lower side, he wants to know what is the best position for the blade, and does it matter if I use one and a quarter or one and a half inch wide on my mill? Well. I've been playing around uh, with that this summer, actually, because we brought in a new blade called a 7 8 deep, um, and it's actually a one and a half. So, I my jury's still sitting out, but the amount I've been able to use it so far this year, I think the one and a half does a better job when the blade loses its initial edge. That's not saying that I think everybody should switch from one and a quarter to start running one and a half because there's a big price difference and you know they're literally they're they're almost double the price of a one and a quarter so you need to have the right place to put that in uh, to make it make sense for you. 
Um, I do think everyone should try it out, though, so that you know the difference and you can decide. Um, can the mills run them? Uh, so the second part of that question. The mills typically can run either blade, okay? They can run one and a quarter or one and a half, but you got to set them up accordingly to do so. Um, the HDs, uh, the, L, uh, the HD36, it's fairly simple. Um, it's just a matter of readjusting your ceramics and away you go because, you know, the ceramic traps that blade on the top and the bottom, right? So it doesn't, it doesn't go anywhere. So if it's one and a quarter or one and a half, it's not such a big deal because you can adjust the guide block. Where things get a little more tricky is if you have rollers and you want to try a one and a half, you really should get a one and a half inch roller. Yeah, you can use your one and a quarters on the one and a half inch blade and they will work, but you're going to get a lot of lead sticking out the front that you have no control on. So it could be, it could be pitching like this on you when you're trying to cut. Um, so I do, I do recommend giving it a try if it's something that you want to experiment with. You know, it's $48 is what those new 7.8 steep blades are worth uh, a piece. Probably best way to do that would be to, if you were ordering another box, just order one because uh, then the shipping won't be anymore and you could just put it in there. And then you can kind of experiment and see uh, if it's going to give you enough time on the mill that you feel it, it's worthwhile. I've, I'm starting to think that it probably is, but I'll let you guys know more at the end of the summer as, uh, as I get more time on it. So that is... That is all the questions that I have. Um, thank you guys that uh, wrote in that we were able to get to today with them. And again, if it's uh, after the fact and you're watching this, please go ahead, put them in the stream. I'll be happy to answer uh, anything that you ask me uh, and get back to you. And I appreciate everybody watching. Thanks a lot. Have a great day.